A reading from the book of Acts in the second chapter, verses 43 through 47. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus was uh, not a great rule follower. He's not known for his rule following, but somehow he embodies the law. We read in Matthew's gospel, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish but to fulfill. I think we're tempted to make Jesus a little more pristine than he was. I think we, we think we're, we're strengthening his claim of divinity and we're perfecting his morality when he's more pristine. But in doing so, we're undermining a really important element of who Jesus was, and that was that he was a rebel. We're, we're undermining the path he took in ministry, which was quite revolutionary. He was not a great rule follower. Now, that's not a bad word, rebel. To rebel is not to sin, especially when you're rebelling against things like oppression and evil and the hypocrisy of false religion. Jesus was a rebel. And if we are to understand the scope of Jesus' ministry, why he did the things he did, why he chose the particular roads he walked, we have to have the right lens. Because Jesus was countercultural. The world isn't going to tell us who Jesus was. Jesus is telling us who Jesus is. And we need some guiding principle, some lens to look at the ministry of Jesus. And I think that lens, I think that guiding principle is rather straightforward. I think it's love. I think it's love. I think that's why Jesus does what Jesus does. I think God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus loves in every action, in every exchange, in every argument, there is love that's motivating him in the gospel stories. The Messiah enters the world out of the love of the world he has. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We read that in John's gospel. It's that love that remains our guiding principle. It's why we do the things that we do. It shapes us as God's people. It's how we understand God's call on our lives. I really like this story. I really like the gospel passage where Jesus is getting flack from the Pharisees because his disciples are hungry and they're plucking grain off of wheat and eating it. Because technically they're breaking a rule. We're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day, and that action of plucking the grain is considered work. And the Pharisees are calling Jesus out because they're Jesus' disciples, and therefore they're an extension of him. What they do wrong, he is doing wrong in, their, in his training and edifying of them. In his response, Jesus recalls the story of David. Kate read that from 1 Samuel how the, the priests were to eat this bread of the presence, and only the priests were allowed to eat the bread of the presence. But when David was sent on a covert mission by the king, him and his companions were starving. And they go into the temple, and they eat that bread of the presence that was only meant for the priests. It was unlawful. Now, in confronting the Pharisees, Jesus declares a superseding idea, an umbrella of how you might come to interpret all of the law. He says, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. If you're doing good on the Sabbath, you're not breaking any rules. Because God's law without love, at its heart, is not the law of God. The heart of the law is Jesus. The heart of God is Jesus. Jesus, the fulfillment of the law. Now, the Pharisees knew the law. Y'all know the Pharisees. We've, we've come up against them uh, almost in every gospel text. And the Pharisees, since they were young boys, were steeped in the Hebrew tradition. They knew the Hebrew scriptures, most of them memorizing all of the scriptures by adulthood. 
No one knows the law better than the Pharisees. It's their job to know the law and to abide by it and to enforce it. Whether they understood the heart of the law, that's the tension with Jesus. Here lies the difference between knowing answers and living into the capital T truth of Christ. When we can see the law in the ways that Jesus lived out the law, when we can do that, when we're not so caught up in the legalism, but we're really reading between the lines, seeing how Jesus enacted the law into the world, it's not then a set of rules. It's actually something to be transformed by, and we will be transformed by it. It's why we come to the scriptures every Sunday. The authority, the guidance they offer, it shapes us body, mind, and spirit. The law is for living into, not just knowing it. In the same way, it's not about knowing Jesus. It's not very helpful if we can lift up a biography of who Jesus was. It's about living in step with Jesus. How many times does Jesus confront the Pharisees in the Gospels? Many times. And it's always the same. They're having some argument as it relates to some legalistic element of the law. And that argument or that legalism is getting in the way of compassion or service or healing or generosity. And rebellious Jesus just won't allow that. His law of land does not stand upon those principles. Now, we're Presbyterians. This is true about our denomination. And so we consider education and intellect and intelligence and reasons as very important. That is something we, we value. And that's good and right. We should value those things. Except if they ever get in the way of the law of love. If our knowing, if our intellect, if our reason ever gets in the way of loving people well, we've gotten off touch. We've gotten off base. At its core, our faith is not about knowing. It's about doing. It's about loving. Four years ago, someone at St. Joe's handed me a baby. It was my baby. I was expecting this moment. It was Bennett. They handed me this baby, and McKay and I did our research about infancy. We were well prepared about this infancy stage of life. We were so well studied, and we're bookish people, so that's our default. We knew what to do, and we had no idea what we were doing. Do you see how this can happen? Y'all, it's wild that a baby is born, and then in 48 hours, the hospital just sends you out. Good luck, the hospital says. This is the journey of all parents with their first child. They do not know what they are doing. And whether you do everything by the book or nothing by the book, what is always true is that we have one guiding principle. And what's that? We love. We love our child. And if we have that, it's enough. It fills the gap of our lack of knowledge, of our lack of experience. If we lead with love, we'll get there. In the book of Acts, we see the church in its infancy. Nobody really knows what they're doing. Jesus ascends. Good luck. And they're about the work of the church for the rest of time. The disciples knew one thing really well. They had watched Jesus. Jesus exemplified this one thing really well. And the early church started to demonstrate this too. What they knew and understood well was that this work of ministry had to be done in love. They sold their possessions and goods and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. They spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, and they praised God. And what happened? The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It was a contagious sort of lifestyle, this love. Friends, you all have looked like the early church to me in response to Hurricane Helene. The ways that you've been so generous, so willing to help, even those who have been afflicted by considerable loss, the ways that you share in fellowship. It is so generous who you are and who you've been in light of the storm. We've all felt that dreadful feeling of not knowing how to help, not knowing what to do, yet we know how to push start on the washing machine. We know how to move furniture. We can collect canned goods. We can fill dumpsters. We're quick to hug those who are hurting. We're getting better at coordinating those folks who are desiring to help with those who are needing help. 
We are contending with that storm well, just as we will contend well with any storm that comes our way. The church is resilient. This church is resilient. You have let your love of neighbor guide you well in this time. And I trust we'll continue to, that, to do that. Be guided by this loving principle of love your neighbor. We'd all, we don't always know what to do. We don't always know how to help. But we're able to walk in step with Jesus, helping folks through love and generosity, service, and healing. And y'all, it's just not our church. We're not the only ones about this work. I've seen the good work of First Presbyterian Tampa, of South Tampa Fellowship, of the Horizons Church. Those are different denominations. They're doing this work. We are, as churches, collectively embracing the needs of the community. And it's not even happening just in our community. You can go up to Unity Presbyterian in Denver, North Carolina. They're taking essentially refugees, refugees in from the western side of the state. And how many other churches around Asheville and Montree are meeting the needs. It's a reminder of the oneness of Christ. Why we gather on World Communion Sunday. It's a celebration. It's a celebration of this oneness. There are so many reminders each and every day, especially in an election season, in the ways that we are different that is thrown in our face, the ways you are different, who to fear and why. This is the reminder that there is oneness amongst God's people, that Christ gathers all around the table. It's festive in its abundance and its diversity of breads. It symbolizes that we are all God's children. And we're reminded of the ancient church when people who didn't know what they were doing gathered around this table before there were creeds or denominations they had enough and that they had the love of Jesus. It is here at this table that we gather as brothers and sisters, the family of faith, despite our differences, despite what we do and do not know. And y'all, this is a table for beginners. This is for everyone who is seeking life anew, those of us with big doubts and big questions and big hurdles in faith. God blesses us around this table, not because we have the right answers, not because we've been living the right way. God blesses us around this table because God has deemed us worthy of God's presence. And God promises to meet us at this table. And there is just one law that we follow in terms of how we come to the table, and that's doing everything in remembrance of Christ. Christ who modeled service and humility. Christ who calls us to love our neighbor. Christ who loved the world so much that he rebelled against the world to seek peace and justice and mercy. It is here we all start afresh, beginners at the table. We move away from harm and we move towards help. Let it be so.